Um, good afternoon. Hi, sorry for the slow start to to the hangout. I'm I'm having uh, some technical difficulties here myself. Um, I'll be with you in two seconds. Um, Guys, I'm terribly sorry. I had some uh, technical difficulties there. Um, welcome everybody to the Storyful Hangout on uh, digital humanitarianism. Um, what I'd like to do while uh, while I get myself organised is to is to introduce our guests. Um, uh, first of all, joining us from UN Acha, um, we have uh, Andrej. Andrej, could you introduce introduce yourself and your organisation, please? Sure, uh, yeah, so my name is Andre Verdi. I work at the UN Office for the Coordination of Humanitarian Affairs and uh, the objective of our organization is to help governments in, in times of large international crises to help coordinate the humanitarian response of international organizations that come in to attempt and hopefully alleviate suffering uh, of affected people. That's great. And Keish uh, is Keish Chapman is involved with um, humanitarian OSM. Keish, uh, could you introduce yourself and tell us what your organisation does, please? Sure. Uh, so I'm Kate Chapman. I'm the executive director of the humanitarian OpenStreetMap team, and we provide a base map that a lot of the crowdsourcing initiatives go on top of. Uh, OpenStreetMap is an online project with the goal of a free map of the entire world, which also happens to be very useful for disaster response. Um, so OpenStreetMap was around, has been around for about eight years, and HOT itself has been around for three and a half. Thank you very much, Kate. And finally, Patrick, I understand you're, you're um, in the thick of it again today. Um, could you introduce yourself and, uh, and tell our listeners what, what you 
uh, your affiliation and what your organization does, please. Hello? Okay, can you hear me now? Yeah, we've got Perfect. you, Patrick. Hi, thanks for organizing this. Really appreciate it. So I'm with a, an institute called QCRI, the Qatar Computing Research Institute, and uh, my mandate there is to develop free and open source humanitarian technologies by drawing on the expertise that my colleagues have in advanced computing, both machine computing and human computing. Okay. Um, very good. Um, the, what I'd like to talk about today is um, digital humanitarianism, and I suppose what I'd like is is somebody to, is maybe Patrick could could take the lead on this and uh, sum up um, what it means to be a digital humanitarian, and um, you know how this is in in some way helping more traditional uh, humanitarian efforts. Um, I think we're still trying to figure that out, right, Kate and Andre, in terms of what what is digital humanitarianism and what it is to be a digital humanitarian. So I think I think um, there are all different flavors of perhaps of that particular answer. I think for me, it's the ability to support formal established humanitarian organizations on the ground um, by carrying out a number of different tasks online and by collaborating online to support, I guess, the information management. Uh, processes and the information needs of established humanitarian organizations. And what's been clear over the past few years is you do not need to necessarily be on site to provide that kind of support, that you can do it um, via connection technologies and, and online. That's sort of my preliminary answer to that question. That's great. So you've got a, you've got a whole uh, network of people who aren't on site, but they're still able to feed into the effort of organizing information. Um, Kate, could you take up the thread there and maybe explain uh, the mapping process and, you know, the importance of this and how people thousands of miles away can uh, can become involved in that? Sure. So primarily, what we do is we take satellite imagery. Um, so imagine something you would see in Google Earth and allow people to define what things are in the images. So if it's a road or a building, um, is the building damaged, that sort of base baseline information. Um, the secondary part of it, or maybe even primary, is there's also already existing data in many places. So OpenStreetMap Philippines, for example, was pretty active to begin with. So it's a matter of now helping them update the data for how it's changed uh, since the typhoon has gone through. Gotcha. So the uh, people have had access to, to uh, a very good and detailed open street map of the Philippines for a long time, and the challenge was to sort of input the new information onto that. Yeah, that was a big part of it. Um, the open street map data varies a bit by location, how filled in it is, usually somewhat related to population. Um, so in some places it was a matter of updating it, and some other places it was creating baseline data where none existed. Okay, well, um, Andrej, you sort of straddle the, the two in that you work for UN ACHA, which is the humanitarian organizing body, and um, you're also uh, involved in, the, in organizing digital humanitarians. Um, can you perhaps explain how the work being done by people on mapping fed into, into relief efforts on the ground um, in the wake of uh, Yolanda? Yeah, so I mean, in mapping specifically, I mean, what we look for when we're producing either offline maps or enabling people with uh, internet connected devices that have mapping in, in the background is we're looking always looking for the best source of maps, the best the, the best detail. I mean, that that's our role and to try to promote that to the community to use. And so in a case like the Philippines here, you know, OpenStreetMap was clearly you know had the the best best the best base layer that we could provide uh, behind maps, whether it's showing damage, whether it's showing locations of camps or, or evacuation centers or, and, and so on and so on. So we, you know, we use that as, as a base layer. So, you know, having the volunteers make, uh, Kate could probably give me the right numbers, but over a million, you know, over a million changes to OpenStreetMap in a hurry uh, really gives a, a much clearer uh, picture of, of what's going on, really improves that base layer 
for people to look at. So in many ways, this is what I describe this as, as well as many of the social or many of the activities of digital humanitarians, is we're really looking at this as a way to augment something maybe we already had, but the base map in this case may have been, you know, maybe it would have been okay, but it, you know, it's been augmented and improved significantly. And these are similar kind of concepts that you know we're working with Patrick on through the Digital Humanitarian Network to to look at social media uh, for information and have digital humanitarians scouring the internet for other information, which we then are starting to feed into existing products. So we are, so we are you know we're trying to augment things that are products that the the responders are used to, so that it isn't something completely brand new and they aren't faced with new things to figure out during emergencies. So we're really trying to augment. We're adding a new flow of information, a new stream of information into things. Uh, so having the volunteers behind that, whether it's creating a better map, whether it's scouring through social media for us, finding that needle in the haystack, as Patrick likes to call it, uh, you know, it, it's really pulling those bits and pieces together to give it a, a more complete picture uh, for the responders. Um, how quickly should responders have this information um, in uh, you know, in after after an event like uh, a natural disaster, um, say maybe could you contrast the situation maybe f ten years ago to today? Yeah, I mean, if you take some, probably even five years ago, but ten years ago, information would come in by people either working that were already in country or. Hearing government reports of people, you know, flying into the country, undertaking assessments with the government counterparts, and you would get that little bits and pieces of information that way, as well as a bit from from the media. What we're looking at today is the fact that we should be able to go through social media and very on various online media sources to get a picture, depending on the event. But you know, like in a typhoon, almost as things are unfolding, uh, things like an earthquake, maybe it's you know very quickly afterwards. But we can we should be able to get a preliminary picture within you know possibly hours that wouldn't be a complete picture but would help people maybe when they're going in to undertake assessments to, get, to make sure that they're, they're a little bit more precise or a bit more targeted because if there's areas that they can see that looks like significant amounts of damages through pictures or videos well do they really need to go there to assess or is the area that's you know completely black on the map where there's nothing showing up maybe that's even worse or Maybe it's better, but it, it, it allows them to, let's say, make more informed questions so that they, you know, so we can get this picture significantly quicker. We can add to, you know, so if somebody's jumping on the plane to go into the country, like the Philippines, on the day of the typhoon or day after, you know, hopefully we can put something into their hands, you know, when they land or before they even get out to the, to the affected area. So I see that we should be able to speed up the initial analysis significantly. Then over time, as we had this time with the digital humanitarians, they were collecting a variety of information for us uh, around projects and activities that OJA has to do on information management, and those were being fed into our existing products and services. And I, I had a conversation with one of the big donors today, and and around just understanding what assessments that had taken place, and they were making comments about you know this is the best collection of assessments they had seen after such a, a major emergency, and that part of those that list of assessments were being collected from public internet sources by the digital humanitarians, and then sending those to us through a structured manner, and then we were adding those to what we call an assessment regime. So people doing surveys, and you know we were collecting, so we we're getting a much more complete picture faster than we usually would in the past. Very much. Um, I think we're going to add a whole load of links um, with uh, very specific data in them to the event page that people can check out later, um, and they're from all the groups involved. Um, but Patrick, maybe you could give us an idea of the scale of the effort, how many tweets uh, were, how much data was was crunched um, uh, in, you know, it, in the uh, when the when the when the uh, when the response was uh, was affected. Uh, sure, uh, and and also perhaps to tie in sort of the last the last question with the first question in, in terms of what Andre was saying. You know, at w digital humanitarians, uh, you know, or at least formal humanitarian organizations five ten years ago, the name of the game was during a disaster there was a scarcity of information. And that was the world that uh, established formal humanitarian organizations operated in. That's how their systems were geared towards managing scarcity. And, and now we have an overflow of information. 
And I think what we've all realized over the past few years is that an overflow of information can be as paralyzing uh, to humanitarian response as the absence of information. And what these digital humanitarian networks, volunteers, and individual groups do is, is, is provide filters to make sense of this overflow, whether it's an, quote, an overflow of satellite imagery, of social media, um, and so on. In terms of a very small part of the digital humanitarian network's response that OHA's request uh, during the first few days of the typhoon making landfall was the use of this micro-mappers tool, which is still very much under development and was far from perfect. Uh, some serious server issues and all kinds of frustrating things that happened. But in any event, we were able to collect um, about a quarter million tweets during the first 70, 72 hours, 48 hours to 72 hours. We used some automated algorithms that a colleague of mine uh, applied to filter for relevancy and uniqueness, and that helped us boil down quarter million to about 55,000 tweets. And we uploaded those to micromappers, and in a period of about five days, we were able to go through about 30,000 uh, of, of, those, of those tweets. Um, and, and then based on that, geolocate the ones that were considered sort of more informative. I wouldn't even say necessarily actionable, because that's a lot to ask for sometimes, but, uh, but at least informative and, and going to what um, Andre was saying, sort of augmenting uh, situational awareness. And uh, so it was... It was it was both uh, great because volunteers were very excited with this new uh, interface to be able to just do microtasking on the fly clicking. At the same time, it was frustrating because for about 12 hours, the system was down. And those are 12 hours that we would have liked to have. And um, so you know, we, we, we learned a few things. And uh, we're going to go back to the drawing board. And we've gotten some good feedback. Uh, in addition to that, we were also tagging images. Um, and uh, by severity of, of damage captured by, by each image. Um, and we still have a long ways to go. Um, and you know, it's easy to really get excited, and there's a lot of hype around these things as well. Um, so you know, yes, we did something perhaps innovative, um, but it was not perfect. Uh, the good news is that the things that were not perfect are totally fixable. And that's what we're doing right now, is to fix those. That's great. And uh, I've seen, I haven't used it, but I've seen pictures of it and just to, to explain to people this is this this app might put a, a one piece of data a picture to you and ask you is the damage in this area severe or mild or is there no damage and you can very sort of quickly as a human go you know put it in the put it in the right category um, so we'll we'll post uh, we'll post some links to that on the event page later and people can check that out themselves um, and I think, you know, something I should just add maybe quickly is that we do, I mean, one of the advantages, and, and, and Kate and the Humanitarian Open Street Map team have been doing this for a long time now uh, with microtasking is that you can triangulate. So what we were doing, we were showing every image and every tweet to at least three different volunteers. And only if there was consensus uh, or more or less overall consensus did that tweet or that image make it to the next, next round. And in addition to these tweet clickers and these image clickers, we, we do have a video clicker to sort of look through video footage and, and tag timestamp when you see infrastructure damage. And also importantly, we have a set of geo clickers where volunteers are invited to try and geolocate tweets, images, uh, and videos. And, and that's going to be an important part, I think, of micromappers moving forward because we had such a backlog of, of tweets and images that still had to be tagged that we didn't have the clickers. So we use spreadsheets, and that can become a little uh, problematic sometimes. But and I suppose if you know if these clickers are very simple pieces of, of technology, um, I find that the you know the open street map is it can be quite intimidating. And I believe one of the things that Kate's organization does is if you're interested, they will show you how to use this technology and get you up to speed. Um, you know, if, if if you wanted to help them out. Is that is that correct, Kate? Um, it is correct. Uh, our primary focus of training is usually people who live in disaster prone areas. Uh, so for example, I'm speaking to you from Jakarta tonight, where we have a program to working with the Indonesian government and the Australian government to help people map their communities before a disaster. Um, the big thing with the 
digital humanitarian response, though, is the OpenStreetMap tools have gotten a lot better in the last couple of years. So since the typhoon, over 1,500 people have contributed information and made over 3 million map edits. If you look at our first major response, which was the earthquake in Port-au-Prince in Haiti, after a month, only 600 people had contributed. And it was far more difficult for new people to get started. So the biggest part is the technology being easier more than anything else. Um, and, uh, you know, in, in terms of, uh, we'll obviously, we'll post, uh, we'll, we'll be posting a lot of stuff to, to the event page, but if somebody would, was interested in, in getting, um, getting into this area and, um, you know, work, working uh, with OpenStreetMap and maybe joining your team, um, how quickly could they get up to speed? Um, I think relatively quickly. Um, we have a we have a learning website called learnosm.org, which has easy step-by-step -step instructions. Um, and if someone really needed help, one of one of our volunteers, I'm sure, would help them. Uh, we have a mailing list and also a live chat through IRC as well. Um, and you can ask us for help on Facebook or Twitter. So there's many ways to reach out to us, and we can help. That's great. And if I could move back to Andrej again, um, uh, in terms of um, in terms of we we spoke about the difference between um, the response in Haiti, which was you know maybe when digital humanitarianism was was just starting to to have an impact to today, um, you know when it's when it's quite well established. Um, from the point of view of uh, somebody who's organizing an aid effort, um, what kind of difference has that made? I think, I mean, what, you know, matured and as Kate has said, you know, the, the fact that technology is becoming significantly easier for, for people to engage, whether it's volunteers or even professionals, you know, it, and I think as these networks have become more formalized and established, I mean, you know, Kate talked about, I think, 600, you know, versus now there's 1,500. And, you know, as we get more and more attention to these things and the groups like Micromappers and the various members of the Digital Humanitarian Network are really sort of, I think, many of them formalized. Some existed, but many formalized a lot more after Haiti, realizing that they could contribute. So groups like Translators Without Borders, Statistics Without Borders, and Data Kind, these groups really trying to formalize makes it, significantly easier for the formal organizations to interface, right? Before, you know, and as, as much as it sounds like a joke, I remember being approached by somebody from, from a large international organization asking me, how do I call in the volunteers? And, you know, they said, do I just send an email to Patrick Meyer? Is that the way it works? Um, so people didn't have the understanding of how to interface. So you know, it's a combination of setting up groups uh, that are becoming well-known, but the Digital Humanitarian Network was really aimed at being an interface to help facilitate at least the understanding of how some interaction would happen. Uh, but then the technology, you know, I mean, as Kate talked about, OSM has, has improved, I think, significantly and made it much easier in the last few years. Patrick uh, has talked about uh, the micromappers, which in, in many ways is, you know, significantly younger, but has improved in an amazing, very rapid speed. So I think as these things become easier and easier to use, more people can really engage. Uh, and it's also quite interesting, you know, that several companies have approached me here in Manila, you know, wanting to contribute their software and their engineers, and people are really starting to get interested in engaging in disaster response. And I think that that will really help streamline, uh, you know, a variety of things, just not from the coordination angle, as, you know, what we're talking a little bit about here from my side, but, you know, helping with logistics, you know, and supply chain management to, you know, just logistical moving of goods, you know, optim optimizing how and how many people should be in types of different facilities. Uh, I mean, I, I came across the, a group that was, you know, an architectural uh, volunteer group just recently that is, you know, in-country helping out. So we're really getting some, you know, interesting groups that are that can engage constructively. And I think that's one of the big things that's, that's changing. And as more and more of this happens, the formal organizations are starting to understand that this, this can help and can augment. And becomes much less of a fearful thing because you know they they see it in Haiti and they didn't understand it, and now as as more and more constructive projects are happening, and and showing very positive results, people are much more willing to have that discussions, usually outside of the emergencies, but willing to have those discussions and figure out how do we start collaborating, 
and working with these you know amazing volunteers around the world to help us improve and augment in their response. Thanks very much, Andrej. I suppose one of the things that struck me was um, the the breadth of expertise within within groups like the Standby uh, Task Force and the Digital Humanitarian Network. You've got translators, people who are experts in satellite imagery, people who are experts in geolocation, um, people who are anal analysts, um, and uh, you've managed to sort of pull all these people together. And you know anybody who's familiar with what we're doing on the Open Newsroom will see the obvious parallels there. I suppose one of the things that we're interested in is, you know, where is this going um, in the future? And uh, I'd like to return to to Patrick to just sort of start that conversation off. Um, what would the next five years look like? No, that's a, anybody's guess, I suppose. But um, you know, I think I think the different members of the Digital Humanitarian Network, new ones. Is, are, that are coming on board are we're all learning. This is I don't think none of us have uh, all the answers, and there are a lot of questions, and we're trying to figure them out as we 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 go along. So it's a lot of running by doing. I don't think we have much of the luxury of just staying in the lab for a year and then coming out and saying, oh, we have the perfect solution, only to realize that the world has changed. Um, what excites me a lot is local local communities that are now more perhaps tech savvy in certain countries and certain regions. These local sort of digital villages that mobilize a lot faster than perhaps even us on the outside. Um, so that's that's neat, and I, I hope to see more of that. I think that'll be a source of innovation and learning for us, as well as our you know an opportunity for us to share with with these local. Uh, tech-savvy communities, what we've learned over the past few years. So ultimately, if we could have, you know, very localized digital humanitarian groups uh, that respond first as the first digital responders, and then are backed up by sort of the international digital humanitarian network when when need be, that would be an exciting sort of development. And and not only just online digital, local humanitarians, but also the offline. We also see folks on the ground. We know that the first responders, by definition, are the affected communities. So both offline and online, more I think we'll see more agency. We'll see more examples of innovation uh, at the local level, uh, and we hopefully will be in a position to learn and, and support that. Thank you very much. And Kate, if I could move on to you, what what do you see happening in the future, and what would you like to see? Um, I wanted to echo uh, Patrick about the engagement between the local communities and the international groups. Uh, for us, we've been working very closely with OpenStreetMap Philippines, and we have multiple times when there's been typhoons or cyclones. Um, but I think the biggest, the biggest difference will continue to be the tools improving and more and more people being able to engage. They're getting easier and easier, because the thing is, everyone doesn't have to be an expert in for, for example, um, like with OpenStreetMap, anyone can learn to look at satellite imagery and interpret it, but how do you enable people to do that more easily? Thanks very much. As, as somebody who's just sort of learned a lot of that stuff in the last, you know, 24 months, I have to agree, you know, you, you just jump in there and, and start doing it, and you bring all your sort of previous knowledge with you, and, um, you know, you, it's, you start to find new ways to use it. Um, Andrej, um, from your point of view, how do you see the the network developing over over the next few years, and and where would you like it to go? Yeah, I mean, I think predicting the future is is a uh, difficult business. Um, you know, I think it's Don Tapscott that says, you know, let's not predict the future, let's build it together. Uh, I think I think that's a key point. Um, but I think both, you know. Reiterating what what Patrick said and Kate said, you know the fact that these these sort of local, much more local digital digital villages, whatever we want to call them, in the, in a variety of countries will start to really pop up. I mean, I've been I'm here in Manila and I've I've been in touch with actually several in, small independent groups. These you know, these are very tech savvy young groups, young tech companies, young volunteers, and they can do a lot and they can do it fast. And they they sometimes aren't you know burdened by the same kind of rules and regulations. Um, or historical baggage that that uh, governments or you know, agencies or so on, and so they're they're really willing to try things. Um, so I think that's you know we'll see a lot of innovation out there. You know it'd be really great to see some kind of 
uh, you know, where the digital volunteers locally are responding and we can really support remotely uh, in, in some kind of way. So I think I think we see an expansion both in that direction and also in the digital humanitarian network. Is, you know, on the, on the global side is is really growing. They're really you know they've added a few new members recently. Really looking at expanding, and I think there's a lot more you know big private firms even that are are interested in joining and bringing a lot more power uh, you know especially in the back end to to these responses. So I think there's there's a lot of potential in the future where it goes. I'm not sure. From my side, I really want to keep directing it to, at least in the short to medium term, into augmenting what's already existing. And then we slowly introduce, you know, the new tools and new approaches so that we don't scare anybody, and uh, but we keep, you know, improving over time. That's great. Um, the, the final thing I wanted to address was really the hardware challenge, if you like. So, I mean, you know, we, we had this tremendous capacity to share information and crunch data, but uh, you know when the disaster when disasters strike, it often knocks a lot of that out. And um, I wonder if if um, all of you who've you know been working at this for a while could give people an idea of how people are working to 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 get that up and running again, and uh, you know the ways in which that sort of reestablishes itself in in the wake of a catastrophe. Should I go first, Patrick? Then? Please. Um, I I think so. First, obviously, this is not a surprise to to disaster responders who work um, in major disasters and response to major disasters. It's almost expected, I imagine. I think to uh, have telcos go offline and and lack of cell phone coverage. Uh, I was talking to Kyla Reed, who is GSMA's uh, disaster response uh, lead. And she just came back from from the Philippines. And what's interesting there is that it's not just the telcos going offline; it's that people have physically lost their phones. Uh, with everything that's happened, and uh, the, the 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 shelters being completely raised to the ground, and so on, people are just they might have kept their SIM cards, but they've lost their their cell phones. So what's happening now with the telcos and uh, and others are trying to find out how to get people phones back, um, new phones, and so on. And a lot of people who are going to the different centers, to the tel tel uh, telephone centers, to to make calls, are actually asking to use their own SIM cards so they can pull up, you know, the address book and so on. Um, it's an issue. It's 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 an issue. I think for mobile operators, it's an issue for GSMA and their disaster response program to understand how to make their communication infrastructure more resilient, so that they do come back online as quickly as possible, and then to also have you know, plans B, C, and D. In terms of enabling you know, groups to continue the ability to communicate, and I know Telecom Sans Frontières are doing some important work in there, as well as other groups. Um, it certainly affects, I think, a lot of what we do in terms of um, trying to collect information from those disaster-affected areas. And I think, as Andre hinted as well, you know, these sort of what I call negative spaces, those areas where you do not get. Uh, say a social media footprint after a disaster, even though you see a baseline prior to um, uh, that. That's very informative. That tells you what your blind spots are. You know, very very quickly. It's incredibly how stark that can that can uh, appear on a, on a map. So, and understanding what the contours and the border areas between areas that do have a uh, social media footprint and those that don't. Th those border areas can be very informative as well. They can sort of you can infer sort of what might be the case. In terms of d disaster damage and so on, in those uh, negative spaces. Thanks very much, uh, Patrick. Kate, would would you like to speak to that as well? And um, well, that's actually not really my area of expertise. I mean, we map we map critical infrastructure. But to the level of if the cell phone tower is working or not, that's not, we're not there yet. Um, it's, it's not necessarily a focus with OpenStreetMap. Okay. And uh, Andrej, um, in, terms of, uh, in terms of UN Ocha's work and, um, you know, I enabling a lot of uh, the sharing of information, uh, what's your perspective on, um, you know, on, on resilience of, uh, of networks? Yeah, I mean it's it's a it's a it's a big challenge, and it's been interesting. You know, I was having a conversation with Kyla when she was in here, and, and had different feedback from the mobile operators here. You know, they had built up uh, contingency plans, and they had felt that they were really prepared. You know, they were preparing for major earthquake type scenarios, and 
you know, this one really was just significantly bigger uh, than they had expected. And when you compare the typhoon, you know, for sort of recorded history, it is the biggest. So they just, you know, hadn't been sort of prepared for the absolute worst case or worse than what they expected to be the worst case. So, you know, getting these kind of things online has been difficult. But, you know, I, I talked to the, the teams that are that are down in Tacloban and these different areas, and they're still struggling. And they, yeah, maybe the mobile phones are there, and I have conversations with them once in a while. But, you know, even the, re the international responders who are down there who are being supported by an international humanitarian partnership uh, group, which brings in, like, tents to work in and sleep in and, and tries to source them fuel and generators, I mean, you know, they, they, there's times where their machines and internet just shut down because the, the power just is too low. And this evening, the IT group just had to shut everything down because the power was just, just wasn't there. So, I mean, they just go offline as, as of about 9.30 this evening. And so, you know, even with a lot of money and resources, it's very difficult. And that's not just talking about the, the phone. Um, now, in terms of the affected people, the men, the women, you know, the children, you know, Patrick talked about they lost their cell phones. Uh, but you know, that's not the only way. So, you know, groups like Internews are really working with the local radio stations. With, you know, they're trying to get these back up in line, share the information that way. You know, at the time of these crises, this is, as the affected community, this is one of the biggest things that they just want information. Not dumps of information, but clear information about what's happening, what should they be doing, where can they, you know, find help in terms of food or shelter, these kind of things. And so there's all, you know, there's a variety of ways that that information can get out through, through, you know, Word of mouth through, through radio, through SMS if they have it available, and so on. And it's quite interesting. Patrick talked about, you know, this project of them trying to figure out how to get cell phones out to the affected. And I wrote a personal blog post about that, you know, a handful of months ago. And people thought I was a bit crazy that we should maybe be looking at giving, you know, smartphones or cell phones as aid. And you know, just proving a case where maybe that actually is something we should be really considering. Um, so I think this is, you know, it's becoming more of a reality. I've talked to other groups about, you know, how. We should be thinking about setting up mobile networks during crises, you know, and there's there's temporary ways to do that. So, you know, I think helping the affected and sourcing information for them and, and, and getting it delivered to them through probably sources that they're used to, whether it's radio, whether it's the government channels, through SMS programs that have already been existing in country before, and it's, it's going to be key. But, of course, you know, it all relies on a certain degree of technology to get that out there. Thank you so much for for uh, for joining us. It's um it, it's it's been a very informative session, and um you know hopefully uh, some people out there uh, uh you know would would like to take it a bit further and get involved um in in the various bit in in the various efforts that are going on. I know that there's people would have quite a wide skill set um listen in and join into our open newsroom. So um, you know, we'd we'd be delighted if 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 some of them became involved in in the uh, the many projects, and we'll be posting a lot of links to the event page if people want to check it out later, um, so that they know where to start. Uh, thank you so much. Uh, thanks for having me. Thank you. Cheers. Bye. Thanks. Bye. Thank you. Thank you.